story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. We're working through the three main themes in the first letter of Peter and in the last talk we looked at the salvation which we need to have as a sure foundation when the pressure comes. We looked at the suffering and how to handle that but the surprise in the letter is the emphasis on submission, on learning to give in, learning to accept what happens. But it's not just in relation to suffering that Peter emphasizes this. He says, first of all, learn to submit to the authorities, the civic authorities. You are citizens, you are subjects. So, honor the emperor. Pray for the king, for the governors, whether national or local. Christians have a duty to be law-abiding citizens. And we should be known for that as those who are glad to pay their poll tax because it brought Jesus to Bethlehem to be born, but also because we are paying for what we receive and we're glad to do it. Christians should not be among those grumbling about taxes. And we honour the authorities, should pray for them, and we should be known as loyal subjects. Now that does not mean that you do everything you're told. There is a limit to obedience to civic authorities and it was Peter himself who once said we must obey God rather than men when he was told by the authorities to stop preaching Jesus in the streets and he said we must obey God rather than men. So there is a limit to submission and that limit comes when the authority tells us to do anything immoral or illegal against the law of God and so there are limits but a Christian must be a loyal subject and should not be arrested because they are rebellious, because they're aggressive towards the authorities. You see that's one of the first sources of the suffering from the civic authorities. Another source of early Christian suffering was for slaves from their unbelieving masters. That was a very difficult position because a slave was totally the property of his master. He had no money of his own, no time of his own, no rights of his own and many of the masters treated their slaves abominably and when the slaves became Christians the masters treated them worse because they thought their slaves were getting too big for themselves and must be kept down. And he says, slaves submit to your masters, learn to give in. Don't fight it. Don't become aggressive or resentful towards it. And even, he says, the harsh masters, not just the good ones. You know, some people believe in submission provided the person you're submitting to is a good person. But he said, no, even the harsh masters. Then thirdly, another great source of suffering was Christian wives of unconverted husbands. And that is a very <coughs> difficult situation and causes great heartache. Wives be subject to your husbands, even the unbelieving ones. And in fact, Peter gives great advice on how to win your unconverted husband for Christ. And it's totally contrary to what we tend to do. When a wife is converted before the husband, she thinks the two things that she must do now is first of all preach at him and secondly pray for him and preferably pray with all the other converted wives for all the unconverted husbands. Peter says neither. In fact, he says if you preach, it's the worst thing you can do. He says you've got to win him without a word. And so many Christian wives go home after church and say, you should have been in church tonight. That pastor might have been just going through your life. <laughs> you know? And um, most Christian wives, after about three months, regret having preached to their husbands. You do it without a word. Well, how do you do it? The answer is, Peter says, become more attractive to look at and more attractive to live with. That's a simple program for Christian wives. 
become more attractive to look at. He says a lot about appearance. There's a beauty column in chapter 3 of 1 Peter. How to become beautiful. Not how to be glamorous, but how to be beautiful. Glamour belongs to the under 40s, beauty belongs to the over 40s. <laughs> I'm serious. The most beautiful woman I ever knew was Miss Harris. She was 84 when I met her. She had enough lines on her face to supply a British telecom with all their <laughs> wires. But anyway, I said to her, do you mind my saying, Miss Harris, you've got the most beautiful face. And her response was surprising. She said, you're not the first man to have told me that. <laughs> then she said this, when I was young, I was so plain, so ugly. I never got a date. I never got asked to dance at the school dance. But she said, when I was 27, I fell in love with Jesus. And she said, for the next week, I was up in the clouds. In fact, she said, I was so happy that he loved me. I said to him, please, Jesus, take the joy away, or I'll trust the joy rather than you. I've had so many Christians pray that God would take the depression away. She was the only one I've ever known, take the joy away. But she said, you know, you get to be like the people you love. She said, that's how I got this face. I'll never forget that. Dear Miss Harris, she'd got the beauty secret from 1 Peter chapter 3. See, that means the older you get, the more beautiful you can get. Good news? <laughs> right. You may leave your glamour behind, but what's glamour? Well now, he says, become more attractive to look at and more attractive to live with. And your husband will say, I got a better wife from Jesus. But you know what many husbands say? Jesus ran off with my wife. It doesn't belong to me anymore. And it's very important that wives learn to go with, with their husbands. But far too many women go to coffee mornings and Bible studies and they become spiritual racehorses while their husband is still at the starting post. And he feels less and less the head of the house. Can I just throw a bit of practical advice in? I was down in South Wales and a lady came up to me and she said, I have a problem. I said, uh, do you have a husband as well as a problem? She said, yes. I said, is your husband your problem? She said, no. I said, well, have you been to your husband with your problem? She said, no. Well, why not? Why come to me? She said, he's not a believer. It's a spiritual problem. I said, but why didn't you go to him with it? She said, don't you understand? He's an unbeliever. He's not got that much interest in spiritual things. How can I take a spiritual problem to him? I said, it's easy. Just go to him and tell him the problem. I said, all you need is a little bit of faith that God will speak to you through your husband. But how can he? He's an unbeliever. I said, listen, God once spoke to a man through his donkey. <laughs> See? And if God can speak to a man through his donkey, God can speak to you through your husband. Now, nine women out of ten accept that argument and laugh, which shows me what they really think of their husband, you see. But um, She was the tenth and she was very angry and she went away and for a whole month she was angry with me and she said, don't go to David with Paulson with the problem. He's unsympathetic if you're not married to a believer. But 18 months later, I'm down in the same lower western valley and there she is again. She came up, she said, I've got another problem, Mr. Paulson. But she says, it's my husband this time. I said, oh, what's your problem? She said, what do you do with a husband who's way ahead of you spiritually? <laughs> I said, are you serious? She said, very serious. He's at the back of the meeting. I said, what happened? She said, for a whole month I was angry with you and then I went to my husband in desperation, told him the problem. He gave me the answer. He said, I don't know who was more surprised, him or me. <laughs> but he began to get interested from that day. No, he's a believer. But he said she's run so fast to catch he's run so fast to catch me up, he's gonna shoot him right past me. And he said, He's way up she said, I don't like him, he's way up here now. I said, You know your problem. You're the manipulator in that partnership. You didn't like him back here, you don't like him up here, you want him just here where you are. You learn to be alongside him. I've told wives who've said to me, How can I get my husband saved? I've said, Stop going to church. They say, no, seriously, how can I get my husband converted? I said, I was serious. It's amazing how many husbands have started coming to church because their wife stopped. See? And Peter is very wise in this. He said, wives, you bring unnecessary suffering on yourself because you're getting further and further away from your husband. But when your husband says, I got a much better wife from Jesus, she's much better looking now. She's much easier to live with now. He's much more likely to come. Well, Peter knew he was married and he understood these things.
Then there's a fourth uh, area of submission. It's not an area of suffering, this fourth one, so he separates it from the other three and brings it in the last chapter. He says, younger, submit to older. And he said, learn to give way to older people, to look to them for leadership. You see, one of the punishments of Israel in the, the prophet Isaiah had to announce was that because they wouldn't go God's way, they would be ruled by women and exploited by youth. What a sentence. It's not irrelevant to our situation either. Ruled by women and exploited by youth. Whereas in normal godly society, older men are looked to. And Peter says, you younger men, respect the elders. Now, in all this, he's not saying blind submission. And where blind submission is demanded by human authorities, that's going to set up real tension. But it's an attitude. And what Peter's saying is in all these areas of life, develop the attitude of not fighting back, of not retaliating, of not being aggressive, of not asserting yourself or your rights. Because that's a whole attitude which will mean that when the suffering comes, you won't be able to handle it. So get ready now. I once said to a dear saint who I've always looked up to, he's elderly now and living on the south coast, I said, Bob, I don't think I could ever face the lions for Jesus. And you know, as an older man, he said a wise thing. He said to me, David, if you are faithful in the little battles now, he will give you the grace when the big crunch comes. That was wise. I've never forgotten what he said because uh, he's an elder. And I looked to him and it was wise advice. So develop this attitude. Have this foundation, develop this attitude, and when this comes, you'll be able to handle it. Now, there's just one problem with 1 Peter. There's a very obscure passage which has, I'm told, 314 different interpretations. <laughs> now, better mention it because if you read it through, you'll understand all the epistle except this bit. And it says something. Well, I've got a whole chapter in my book on hell on it, so you can read that chapter for an exposition of this little bit. But it says something about Jesus being put to death in the body and made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to those who were disobedient in the days of Noah's flood. And then a few verses later he says, this is why the gospel was preached even to those who were dead, that they might be saved in their spirits. And I'm afraid on the basis of this passage, liberal preachers have based their doctrine of a second chance of the gospel after death, which every other scripture says is impossible. Death seals our fate. There's a great gulf fixed beyond death. But here apparently Jesus did preach. And I find that the trouble with the, all the many interpretations is that people are trying to get round the simplest, plainest meaning of it, because it, it is an awkward passage to fit in with the general teaching of the scripture that death is the end of your opportunity of salvation. And yet, if you take it at its face value, and I always start by taking scripture in its simplest, plainest sense, and only changing that if it really is difficult, and in its simplest, plainest sense, it says that between his death and resurrection, Jesus was active, conscious, and actually communicating with others who were also fully conscious and communicating with him. Now, of course, you never hear about this in church because all Holy Week services finish on Friday and start up again on Sunday. So you're never told what Jesus was doing on the Saturday, right? But you see, we tend to think of Jesus doing nothing between his death and resurrection, being just unconscious, inactive in the tomb. But it says only his body was dead. But his spirit was very much alive. And he went to the world of the dead and he was preaching. I can imagine Peter meeting Jesus on the first Easter Sunday. We know he met Peter. We don't know where, we don't know when, we don't know what was said. But I'm imagining now, but I think I'm not far off. I think Jesus, 
Peter said, Jesus, where on earth have you been? And Jesus said, I haven't been on earth, I've been in Hades, Sheol, the world of the departed. But what on earth have you been doing? For, sorry, what in Hades have you been doing for three days and three nights? Actually, it was three days and three nights. Jesus died on the Wednesday afternoon. All the evidence points there. Uh, we've been fooled because he died the day before the Sabbath, but it was not the Saturday Sabbath. John's Gospel says, now that Sabbath was a special high Sabbath and the Passover began with the Sabbath. And in the year AD 29, which is almost certainly the year Jesus died, the 15th of Nisan, the first day of the Passover, was on a Thursday and was the Sabbath. And the Wednesday would be the 14th, the eve of the Passover. Well, that's just my theory, but it fits all the evidence better than all the other theories. It doesn't matter really what day Jesus died on, he died for you. That's the important thing. But he said it would be three days and three nights, and you cannot fit that in between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning. But if he died at three o'clock on the Wednesday, and he rose between 6 p.m. and midnight on the Saturday, every bit of the Gospel evidence fits. And of course, 6 p.m. on the Saturday evening was the first day of the week. We will think in terms of Roman calendar instead of Jewish calendar. But that was the first day of the week, and long before dawn the tomb was empty. Well, that's just an aside. But if, if you don't accept that theory, you will have problems with some of the data in the New Testament. It does all fit. There is a way to see round these contradictions or apparent contradictions. But leave that aside. What was he doing for three days and three nights? And Jesus must have told Peter, I've been preaching. Who to? All those who were drowned in Noah's flood. Now that means that those who were drowned in Noah's flood were also conscious. You will be fully conscious one minute after you're dead. You will know who you are, you will have your memory. It's only your body that dies, not your spirit. Death separates body and spirit. Later, spirit and body will be reunited in the resurrection, but much later for us. But Jesus went through all three phases in less than a week. He was an embodied spirit until he died on the cross, then he commended his spirit to God and his body was put in a tomb. Alive in the spirit, he went and preached to those disobedient people from Noah's flood. And then his body and spirit were reunited on Easter Sunday morning. But he was fully conscious and able to communicate all the way through. That's very, very important. It's only the sects who teach soul sleep in between the two bodies. That's another story. Now then, if we take that at face value, it does mean that Jesus went and preached the gospel to that particular generation and only to them. And it does clearly imply that it was a gospel that could save them and redeem them. So, isn't this a second chance after death? I'm prepared to say yes it is, for them and for them only. There is no hint in the Bible that anyone else would ever have such an opportunity. So why should it be given to them and them alone? And what I'm going to say now is pure speculation. Now don't blame me if you don't believe it, it's just my guess. When I get to heaven, I'll, I'll check it up and then I'll tell you whether I was right or wrong. <laughs> but this is my guess. There was one generation who could accuse God of being unjust and unfair. You wiped us out and then promised never to do it again. And I believe God, to cover his justice and his righteousness, said, son, just go and tell them the gospel. I won't have anyone in the day of judgment accusing me of treating anybody unfairly. Well, that's my guess, but I know a God of righteousness who bends over backwards not to be unfair not to have favourites, and maybe that's why. But I believe it's better, rather than to try and twist Scripture to fit our system, to accept it in its simplest, plainest value, but limit it to what it says. And there is no ground here for a second chance for anyone else, what Alfred Lord Tennyson, whose centenary we celebrate this year, called the larger hope the hope that we'll all get a chance after death. That's universalism, and that's not taught in the Scripture. Well, that's 1 Peter. Now I'm going to move on to 2 Peter, the second letter he wrote. 
And we're back to a, a little diagram, but one that's very much easier to understand. <laughs> Sorry I gave you such complicated ones in Hebrews and earlier, but here's one I'm sure you can all understand perfectly plainly. But the second letter of Peter, don't try and copy it all right down straight away, because I'm not going to refer to this for a few moments. The second letter of Peter deals with a totally different situation. Same people, but a few years later. It's different in style, and those differences could well be that he's using a different secretary, a different amanuensis. And indeed he says he's using Silvanus, Paul's secretary, who probably knocked it into shape. But the similarities are all there. Peter's favourite words still appear in the second letter as well. Some scholars say the second letter is not by him. I believe it is by him. Do you know Peter's favourite word? All preachers have favourite words. All you have, Chris. I've noticed them already. <laughs> you must have noticed mine. Do you know what Peter's favourite word is? I think it's one of his favourite words as well. Precious. Right? You've used that word. And that was one of Peter's favourite words. And if you go through the two letters, you'll find he keeps talking about our precious faith, our precious Jesus. Everything's precious to Peter. He's found the pearl of great price. And he loves using that word, precious, precious. It's, it's the word you use of something or someone that's so valuable to you. My most precious possession. See? Precious. So that convinces me it's Peter. But I'm prepared to think he's using a different secretary. That would account for the different of style quite comfortably. But the content of the letter is totally different and the reason for that is that he's now talking about dangers inside the church. There are two kinds of pressure we face, the pressures from outside the church and the pressures from inside. And it's the ones from the inside that are the more dangerous. I told you earlier that Satan has never destroyed the church from outside. The more he hits it from the outside, the bigger and stronger it gets. And that's why during the first three centuries of Christianity, when Christians were being thrown to the lions regularly, the church never grew so fast. That's why behind the Iron Curtain formerly, behind the Bamboo Curtain today, you can go to China and find villages where 85% of the population are born again. Now the church has stopped growing behind the Iron Curtain. Since the Iron Curtain came down, it's tragic. It was with pastors in East Germany they said it was far easier to build a church before the Iron Curtain came down. Now all our folk are going materialistic like the West and church attendance is declining. So, were you glad when the Iron Curtain came down? It's a mixed blessing. And in fact the church is not what it was now in Eastern Europe. But at least the door's open for us to go in there and help if we can. But in China, still the bamboo curtain and the church is growing and growing and growing. But Satan can destroy it from the inside and I'm afraid hostility is one thing, that's a simple pressure. But heresy is a subtle pressure. And 2 Peter is about this bigger danger. Now, there is one question that arises when you read 2 Peter, especially chapter 2, you will find that it's almost word for word the letter of Jude. Have you, some of you had noticed that. Now, there are five possible explanations. When you find two writers in the Old or New Testament saying the same words, there are five different explanations. It's not a problem. It's, the problem is which of the answers to choose. For example, Micah and Isaiah. Have you ever noticed that there's one section in Isaiah 2 and Micah 4, or is it the other way around? Behold in the latter days the mountain of the Lord, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Word for word. And both Isaiah and Micah say it. Now when you come across that phenomenon in Scripture, there are five possibilities. Here they are. Number one, Peter borrowed it from Jude. Number two, Jude borrowed it from Peter. Number three, Peter and Jude borrowed it from somewhere else. Number four, Peter and Jude got together and discussed the problem and agreed on the solution <laughs> and sent it in different letters. Number five, the Holy Spirit gave them exactly the same words, both of them. Well, take your pick. I'm inclined not to believe the last one 
because the Holy Spirit doesn't use people as word processors. We mustn't think that inspiration of Scripture means that people were just typewriters on which the Holy Spirit typed. And so it's unlikely that the Holy Spirit would give exactly the same words to two different people. I think it does mean that Peter and Jude did know each other. Whether one got it from the other or the other got it from the one or they both got it from somewhere else, I think there is evidence of some collaboration. But then Peter was one of the inner circle of disciples and Jude was another of the Lord's own brothers. And it is highly likely that they knew each other. But anyway, their, their material in the second chapter, and of course Jude is very short, it's the same length as Peter's second chapter. Well, it's the same problem was hitting both their churches. And I can summarize it in four things. If you've heard my tapes on Jude, Jude, you know what's coming. Jude is a most neglected little letter. We haven't time to go through it. But there were four corruptions happening, four symptoms of a disease right inside the church, a cancer in the body of Christ. And here they are. Number one, a corrupt creed. A corrupt creed. The beliefs were being changed. And two in particular, a sentimental view of the grace of God and a syncretistic view of the person of Christ. Now, forgive the complication there. Turn it the other way around. A syncretistic view of the person of Christ. They were saying, he is not the only Lord, he's just one among others. Compar comparative religion. He is a way, but there are many other ways to God. He is not the only way. That's that, that word only which is the offence, you know. So they were corrupting the person of Christ and saying he's a way, not the way. And then they had a sentimental view of the love of God, the grace of God, which says, God loves to forgive you, so it doesn't matter if you sin. Now you can imagine what that would do. A corrupt creed means, secondly, a corrupt conduct. What you believe affects your behaviour. And invariably, when you change Christian faith, you introduced immorality into the church. And I'm afraid immorality was getting into the churches that Peter and Jude were writing to. See, if it doesn't really matter how you live, now that you've got your ticket to heaven and that God loves to forgive you, so he'll go on forgiving you no matter what you do. That is sheer sentiment. It's being preached widely. But of course it means that Christians go on sinning, take advantage of God's mercy, and it leads to immorality. But when conduct has been corrupted, the next thing that is corrupted is character. And there's a description of the effects of all this on the character of people. And they become more animal than human. Operate by base instincts. They become greedy and lustful. And their character changes. They are no longer reliable. They're like clouds driven by the wind, waves of the sea, all these descriptions are there. It's vivid of weak character. And the fourth thing that gets corrupted is conversation. And the church gets filled with grumblers and complainers and people rebelling against leadership and all the kind of unrest that you can get in a fellowship. Now both 2 Peter and Jude go through this. The corrupt creed, a change of belief, a corrupt conduct that follows from it, immorality. A corrupt character that weakens people's character and personality. And a corrupt conversation that issues from that weak character so that you get a general unrest and a grumbling and a complaining and talking against leadership. Now all that's devastating and I'm sure as I go through it you recognise that this is happening in many churches. And both 2 Peter and Jude fought this thing hard. They saw that it would finish off the church and it wouldn't need suffering from outside. The thing would have collapsed from within and a church like that under persecution will not stand. Now 2 Peter follows exactly the same kind of pattern as 1 Peter, which convinces me again. It's in, from the same author. There is a section on salvation then a section on the danger, and then a drawing out of the implications and how to be ready to cope. 
And this diagram sums up the first part of 2 Peter, the section on our salvation. It's a lovely, uh, simple picture. Um, here is the household of faith, built on the foundation of faith. There are some steps of faith up to the front door, which are not in 2 Peter, but are in Peter's sermon in Acts, so I've just put them in. First step, repent. Second step, be baptized. Third step, receive the Holy Spirit. No more steps up to the front door than that. And all three are steps of faith. Again, get my book, The Normal Christian Birth, for spelling that out. So, now we have entered the household of God, the household based on faith, by taking these steps. But now there's a staircase inside. And he says, to your faith add virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to your knowledge self-control, to your self-control patience, to your patience godliness, to your godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. And in climbing that staircase, you are building up your hope. He's talking about a grand entrance into glory about making your calling and election sure. If you want to make your calling and election sure, you can't do it at the bottom of the staircase. You do it by climbing up those stairs. That's how you make it sure. By reaching the upper room of love, which is where the church should be living. But he emphasized that you're building up your hope for the future as you climb these stairs. And your certainty about what God is going to do will get stronger and stronger as you climb the stairs. So the church is founded on faith, grows in hope as it climbs these stairs. And the climax is living in love. And there's a balcony upstairs, and from that balcony you take off for glory. <laughs> All right? And you make a grand entrance. A rich welcome will be given you in heaven. So it's really saying progress. Don't sit down in the sofa on the ground floor. <coughs> Climb the stairs. Live in the upper room. Get up there as quickly as you can. In other words, the answer to heresy is maturity. People down here are vulnerable to false teaching on the ground floor. The higher you go, the more you're living up here, then the less you are vulnerable to heresy and false teaching. But if you listen to false teaching, you'll find yourself going out a back door and slipping down a slippery slope and falling. And he says some pretty severe things about this. He says, it would be better for you never to have known the way of righteousness. Better for you never to have entered than to fall. And he has some pretty crude remarks about a dog going back to lick its own vomit. Have you seen a dog do that? He said, that's what you're doing. You came from sin, you're going back to it. You're like a dog going and licking up its sick. Or you're like a pig that's going back to wallow in the mud after you've bathed it and washed it. <coughs> Vivid. But take those words seriously. It's better never to have known than to fall away. To fall from grace would be better if you'd never heard about grace. Better for someone who's never heard than someone who has and goes back to their own sick and their own mud. And that happens through false teaching, which erodes the foundation of faith. So, uh, alas, there are some people who come in the right way and go straight across and out the back door and slip or at some later stage do that. And there are those who climb the stairs, get stronger in hope, and reach the room of love, and take off for glory. These go back under the wrath and judgment of God. These enjoy the sunshine of His grace and favour. That's quite a message, isn't it? Then the final chapter in 2 Peter takes this whole notion of hope for the future, one of the pressures inside the church that they were having were people who say, all this talk about the second coming and all this talk about, you know, Jesus coming back. Well, where is he? 
And already in the first century, people were saying, well, where is he? And if they said it then, how much more people can throw it at us today? 2,000 years and he's still not back. See? And scoffing is a very difficult thing to handle when people make fun of your faith, isn't it? And Peter in the third chapter of his second letter says, these scoffers, they say, where is the promise of his coming? All things are just as they were at the beginning, nothing's changed. And I'm afraid people say to us, Christianity's been in the world 2,000 years and look at it. Nothing's any better, nothing's changed. Ah, but we still have hope. And our hope is this, that one day all this universe is to be dissolved in fire. There's to be another holocaust. And it's not this time to be a flood of water, but a flood of fire. I just imagine, not that it would be a nuclear war, but that God would just release all the energy in every atom. He packed the energy into the atom, all he'd need to do would be to unlock it. The whole thing goes up in smoke. And then it says, but out of the fire, like a, a phoenix rising from the flames, there's a new heaven and a new earth. I love preaching about the new earth. Don't leave it to the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's our truth, it's in the Bible. But I'm afraid Christians only want to hear about going to heaven. There's a new earth coming. We shall see that when we look at Revelation. This earth is going to be the centre of the future. A new earth, a new planet on which we'll live. We're the only ones who know this. Everybody's panicking about the ozone layer and the polluted oceans and the dying forests. They're panicking because they think this is the only planet we'll ever have to live on. We know better than that. We look for a new heavens and a new earth. But there is going to be something about the new heaven and the new earth which will be so different from this planet we have known. And the difference will be this. It will be a new heaven and earth in which righteousness dwell. There will be no vice, no crime, no sin. Nothing dirty, nothing filthy. <coughs> nothing. Now, if you really believe that, Peter says, you won't listen to all these scoffers, you know it's coming. But what manner of people, what manner of people ought we to be if we know all this? That all this world is going and a new world is coming in which no sin will ever be allowed. Well, the answer's simple. You live holy and godly lives. You get ready. Start packing. And so his real defences against all the immorality that can get into the church through false teaching. You keep your eyes fixed on that new world, a world of righteousness, and that'll hold you to your righteousness. Keep you living right, because you know that if you don't, you won't be part of that new world. So live up here in faith, hope and love and get ready for glory. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, you'll have your first free flight to the Holy Land. <laughs> what a meeting. That's the word on my grandfather's tombstone in Newcastle. Three words from an old Methodist hymn. There is his name, David Ledger Porson, and underneath, what a meeting. And if you don't like noisy worship, don't be around. The archangel will be shouting, the trumpet's blowing, it'll be enough to raise the dead. <laughs> That's exactly what it'll do. And those who've died will get front seats, so don't worry if you die first. You'll get a front seat then because you rise first and we shall all meet him in the end. Beyond that, a new heaven and a new earth. Peter says, keep your hope fixed on that and you will live the way that you will need to live to be part of that new world. You won't listen to this rubbish. You won't get caught up in it and tainted by it. You'll keep yourself unspotted even from the apostate church. Never mind the world and you'll go for it. Well, thank you, Peter, for those two letters. They're going to hold us. At the moment, there's more pressure inside the church for heresy than outside in this country, so two Peter is more relevant at the moment. But there will come a day fairly soon when one Peter will be the letter that will hold us to faith, hope and love. Amen. Amen.